Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. Tensions on the border are high tonight. Hundreds of visitors are in Maverick County right now after a massive rally to protect to protest record migrant crossings. We showed you earlier this evening. It's been pretty peaceful, but local law enforcement is ready to protect and serve if needed. The night team's Daniela Ibarra is still there on the border tonight with what leaders are calling the epicenter of the crisis. Protesters and locals show Daniela a range of emotions over a complex issue. The concertina wire at the border electrifies the migrant debate. Last month's Supreme Court ruling allowing the feds to cut it is what brought Jim Shearer all the way down from Utah. I'm down here to support the state's rights to, to protect their own interests. And I think without the states, the federal government doesn't exist. He's one of a few hundred people in Quemado, Texas at a Take Back Our Border rally, a smaller group than expected. It's one of three rallies across the southern border protesting immigration policies. Immigration is definitely broken, definitely. Many of the protesters are Trump supporters, like Rebecca Broughton from Seguin. I love America. I love everybody here. I even love the illegal immigrants, but come legally. Eagle Pass has been a hot spot for migrant crossings, men, women, and children from all over the world. Some of them have died, some of them have been cut, some have been raped, some have been killed, but you know what? They want to be part of the American dream, just like anybody else. Migrant advocate Jesse Fuentes has seen the ebb and flow of people crossing the river and those coming to protest. You can't come down here in a day and understand the society, the culture, the history. You have to, uh, you know, inform yourself. He says he welcomes peaceful protests, but says he wants the problem solved. We're treating human beings like, like a herd of cattle, and it's not proper and uh, people are dying and uh, we need to address the issue with processing centers. Danielle Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. Now tomorrow, 14 Republican governors, including Texas Governor Greg Abbott, will come to Eagle Pass. They'll get a briefing on Operation Lone Star and are expected to talk with media right afterwards around 2.30. Daniela will be there filling us in on those talking points. Well, when it comes to covering what's happening at the border, of course, you can count on KSAT for in-depth coverage nearly every day. To stay on top of the latest news and headlines, just scan the QR code on your screen or follow along on KSAT.com. All right, switching gears now to a look outside with live cam. We had a bit more sunshine out there today as we have been drying things out following a couple of different batches of rain and thunderstorms that pushed through San Antonio and a good chunk of South Central Texas last night and very early this morning. Now rain chances come down in the days ahead, especially for the back half of the weekend. Plenty of sunshine in store, but the biggest thing that you're going to notice, they're going to start picking up overnight, really gusty out there first thing tomorrow morning, the winds. In fact, wind gusts upwards of about 40 to even 50 miles per hour are expected throughout Sunday morning before they start to calm down just a little bit into the afternoon and evening. Other than those winds, it's going to be a beautiful day. A chilly start in the mid 40s, high temperature topping off in the upper 60s with more blue skies, and that pattern is going to continue into the first half of the upcoming week. We're going to talk about that, plus get you a look at those rainfall totals coming up in just a few. All right, thank you so much, Mia. A license in limbo. The city gave one salvage yard on the southwest side a warning that their license to recycle could be revoked. This comes after several code violations and neighbor safety concerns. The 19th's Avery Everett has followed the story for months and shows us what's next for Monterey Iron and Metal. An operation in full steam, even with its license on the line. After more than a century in San Antonio, Monterey Iron and Metals license to recycle could soon be revoked by the city. I confirmed this with the spokesperson for the city's development services department this week. Multiple code violations were cited to be the reason why this license is now in question. The city says it sent a letter giving Monterey 30 days to appeal in front of council before that license would be lost. Even on a Saturday, Monterey Iron is on the move. Take a look right behind me. You can see some of those cranes actively working. And a spokesperson for the company says they're also working behind the scenes, getting ready to appeal. That spokesperson sent a statement over email to me that read in part, despite concerted efforts to operate our company responsibly, ethically, and safely, the city is threatening to revoke our license. Later in that email, it also said, quote, 
we remain committed to working with city officials to resolve any issues so that we may continue to serve the community as we have for the past century. But this isn't the first time we've told you about safety concerns surrounding Monterey. Back in November, neighbors held a community meeting calling for help from city and state leaders. It's important that we don't have to worry about fires and smoke and dust and whatever else is coming off the salvage yard. Since that meeting, these neighbors have been collecting testimonials. They're calling for Monterey to change its practices. They say learning this license is in limbo is a step, but it's not yet a solution. I can't say that it's a sigh of relief because we're not at the end yet. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a breath. Neighbors say they're working to meet with council members to talk about their concerns before Monterey appeals. All we want them to do is be the good neighbors comply with the rules and regulations. But as the clock ticks down, Monterey says it's also working with the city to keep their operations up in full swing. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio Animal Care Services starting the engine on a new program that will help pet owners better take care of their furry friends. With the help of Spay and Neuter Network, this truck will cut down on the hassle pet owners face when getting their pet spayed or neutered. Here's how it works. The truck will park at a community center or a park in your neighborhood. You drop your pet off, they get taken to the clinic to be spayed or neutered, and they're reunited at the same spot later that afternoon. We know that getting across town can be prohibitive to people getting their pets spayed and neutered, and we want to help them out through our transport program. It is basically like a bus transport for your pets to come to our clinic for the services. Owners won't need to worry. The truck is air conditioned and it also has heat. The goal is to get the program fully functioning sometime in March. Well, this kind of story is nothing new to KSAT. Back in December, we profiled Dignity Hill in our Know My Neighborhood series. Neighbors there are using a similar kind of program to fill the gap and make sure the pets there are spayed and neutered. For a larger look at all of our Know My Neighborhood stories, just scan this QR code that you see on your screen. An investigation underway now after San Antonio police opened fire on a man they say shot at them. Around 1030 last night, officers were called out to the home on West Malone Avenue and Zarzamora Streets. When they got there, officers say the man came through the main doorway holding a gun. SAPD said their officers tried to get him to drop it, but instead he fired around and the officers return that fire. The man shot is expected to be okay. Five officers were involved and have between three and 13 years on the force. The report did not mention if the officers were put on administrative leave, which is protocol. So we've reached out and are double checking on that. The militaries of the U.S. and U.K. launched strikes against Houthi targets in Yemen in response to the Houthis' repeated attacks against international shipping and naval vessels, at the Red Sea. These latest strikes coming one day after the U.S. launched airstrikes against pro-Iran targets in Iraq and Syria in response to the drone attack that killed three U.S. service members. Here's ABC's Chuck Sievertson with the details. Officials confirming that U.S. and British forces supported by six other countries have unleashed a new large-scale attack on at least three dozen Houthi targets in Yemen. American F-18 fighter jets from the USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier, along with Tomahawk cruise missiles launched by the USS Kearney and USS Gravely, hitting 13 different locations. U.S. Central Command forces also saying earlier they struck six Houthi anti-ship cruise missiles prepared to launch. The U.S. also says it destroyed 12 Houthi drones on Friday, either mid-flight or ready to be launched from Yemen. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin releasing a statement saying the strikes on Yemen aim to disrupt and degrade the capabilities of the Iranian-backed Houthi militia from continuing to attack vessels in the Red Sea. According to Austin, the strikes targeted the Houthis' deeply buried weapons storage facilities, missile and air defense systems, and radars. A senior Biden administration official says Saturday's strikes are unrelated to the action the U.S. took on Friday in response to the January 28th drone attack that killed three U.S. service members at Tower 22 Outpost in Jordan. This long-range supersonic B-1 bomber taking off to participate in those airstrikes. The U.S. hitting 85 targets across seven locations in Syria and Iraq. Before and after, satellite images show some of the destruction. As those airstrikes got underway, the White House signaling more were coming. We will not hesitate to defend our people, 
and hold responsible all those who harm Americans. These responses began tonight, but they're not going to end tonight. President Biden has repeatedly said he does not seek direct conflict with Iran. Iran's foreign ministry saying the American barrage is a threat to regional and international peace and security. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News, New York. President Joe Biden's first primary victory came in South Carolina today. The contest, the first Democratic primary of this year's election cycle. The first in the South primary was decided shortly after the polls closed this evening. It comes three weeks ahead of the Republican primary in South Carolina. South Carolina's former governor, Nikki Haley, looking to fend off Republican frontrunner and former President Donald Trump for her first primary win on February 24th. And now is the time to make sure you are registered to vote. The Texas primary election in March will be here before you know it. You have until this Monday, February 5th, to register and submit an address change for the midterm election. You can check your status or verify information on the Texas Secretary of State's website. Early voting will begin towards the end of February, and Election Day is March 5th. We did not know what this building was. We thought it was a dance hall. Last summer, we told you about a couple who unknowingly bought a former slave plantation in Wilson County. Hear why they decided to look into the history of White House Polly Mansion and how the home is now being used to honor the past. Plus, a new plan that would give Israel wartime aid could soon be set to a vote in Congress. What makes this bill different from the one senators have been trying to agree on for weeks? In your night beat news flash, the House will vote next week on a standalone deal to give more wartime aid to Israel. House Speaker Mike Johnson's proposal would direct $17 billion worth of aid to Israel as they continue to fight its war with Hamas. Meanwhile, key Senate leaders are still hashing out details of their own aid bill that would give money to Israel and Ukraine, as well as set aside funds for the boosted security at the southern border. Seven of the eight people killed in an Illinois shooting spree were laid to rest today. Christine and William Esters and Tamika, Joshua, Alexandria, Alana and Angel Nance were, remor were memorialized at their church in Joliet, Illinois. All seven were related to 23-year-old shooter Romeo Nance, who took off and drove all the way to this gas station in Natalia, where he was cornered by law enforcement before taking his own life. That eighth victim that was shot had no connection to Nance. And people all over Oklahoma were woken up by a 5.1 magnitude earthquake late last night. That rating ties for the fourth largest earthquake in the state's history. The epicenter of the quake was in Lincoln County, 50 miles east of Oklahoma City. Right now, there are no reports or of injuries or damages, but USGS officials are still surveying the situation. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Longhorn cattle strutted their stuff through downtown San Antonio today. The annual cattle drive is held to commemorate San Antonio and Texan heritage leading up to the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. Tickets for the 75th year of the rodeo are now on sale. You can keep up with all things rodeo on the KSAT Rodeo page on our website, ksat.com. I am so excited for the rodeo. I know. And it was it was great weather it for was, that this morning. It really was. Yeah. We got the rain out just yeah. in time. We had a few clouds stick around this morning, but all in all, just a little breezy, but we had plenty of sunshine. Yeah, and people had their hats and bandanas yeah. on, so it was perfect they for the were, weather. They were all ready to go. <laughs> exactly. So much needed rain that yes. we saw yesterday. So Let's actually take a look at some of those rainfall totals that we had in and around the San Antonio area. Generally, the lower totals, the farther west that you went, Del Rio 0.18, Uvalde 0.19. Higher totals the farther east that you went, east of I-35, especially over two inches of rain recorded in Cuero, 1.75 out east in Hallettsville over there in Lavaca County. For us here in San Antonio, 0.84 officially at the airport, 0.58 out east in Converse, also over half of an inch off to our northwest in Scenic Oaks. So definitely more of that drought denting rain that we like to see. All right, low pressure system that was responsible for bringing all of that rain into our region last night. Currently off to our north, you can see it is still sparking widespread rain near the Mississippi River Valley this Saturday night. That's going to continue to work eastward. We are drying things out across south central Texas in the days ahead. Don't even have any notable rain chances in the forecast through Wednesday and then just isolate it as we head into the second half of the upcoming week and into next weekend. So now that we are calming things down out there on the radar, focus is going to turn to the winds.
winds, especially as we head into the overnight and first thing tomorrow morning. You can see as of right now, we don't actually have a whole lot being registered in terms of those actual wind gusts, but I do anticipate that changing as early as midnight. You can see here on your future cast, especially west of the I-35 corridor for places already like Bernie, Kerrville, stretching over to Lakey, Bandera, already could start seeing some of those gustier winds in the range of about 35 to 40 miles per hour. Watch as that continues to advance eastward through the overnight by wake up time tomorrow. We are expecting some gusts in the 40, potentially even 50 mile per hour range at times. That's going to continue throughout the first half of the day before we start to see those winds subside just a bit more into your Sunday afternoon and especially into tomorrow evening. But a good idea to make sure all of those loose lawn items are secured if you haven't done so already. If you have any of those empty trash cans out there on the sidewalk, make sure that those are brought inside. Also, it is worth noting out west closer to the Rio Grande near Del Rio and Eagle Pass, where we haven't seen as much rain, unfortunately, with the past couple of rounds that have moved through. High fire danger is expected tomorrow because of those winds, the drier vegetation and the low humidity in place. We've got those red flag warnings slated to go into effect at 9 a.m. tomorrow. All right, until then, temperature wise, it's a little chilly out there. 52 degrees right now here in San Antonio through the overnight clear skies in place. Temperatures falling a little bit more. It is going to be a chilly start first thing Sunday mid to upper 40s, maybe a few low 50s, especially south and east of town. Other than the wind tomorrow, it's going to be a gorgeous day. Plenty of sunshine, 64 degrees at noon, 67 by 2 p.m. High temperature topping off in the mid to upper 60s. I think a few low 70s expected in and around the San Antonio area there as well. 70 in Pleasanton, 68 in Nixon, 70 out west in Sabinal, as well as Uvalde. Looking ahead to the upcoming week, there's that quiet weather pattern that takes over. Chilly mornings followed by nice and comfortable afternoons. A touch more humidity works in ahead of next weekend. The cloud cover returns. Low temperatures come up there a bit as well, and we'll monitor for those isolated rain chances that return, especially into next weekend. Ooh, perfect. It's going to be That's nice. perfection. Thanks, Mia. What wasn't perfection, Nick, was the Spurs loss. Yeah, Courtney, okay. not the way the Spurs fans wanted to see the homestand end before the rodeo road trip. We're going to talk about the Spurs loss of the Cleveland Cavaliers. And we're also going to hear from the all-star basketball players in the first ever San Antonio sports all-star basketball game. So stay with us. The San Antonio Spurs seven game homestand came to an end tonight. The Spurs look to bounce back after a heart wrenching one point loss to the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, Victor Wembanyama finished with another double double with 19 points and 10 rebounds. Devin Vassell led the way for all the Spurs shooters with 22 points, but it was the star guard for the cap. Oh my goodness, look at that from Wemby. But then, let's get back to that star guard for the Cavs, Donovan Mitchell. He just went ahead and dropped 31 points. He even got ejected after a fight with Zach Collins at the end of the game. As the Cavs are going to win it 117-101, to they'll now start their nine-game rodeo road trip on Wednesday when they take on the Miami Heat. In college hoops, the Texas Longhorns have had a rough couple of outings. Coming into today's game against the 25th ranked TCU Long or Horn Frogs, needed a big road win after losing two straight. The first half included some big defensive plays as Kendall Weaver gets the steal flying high to the rim. Then another interception, this time Dylan Mitchell. And he's got some room to go for the windmill dunk. Longhorns just having some fun again. Now second half, more from Mitchell. Working in the paint, getting the bucket and a trip to the line. Mitchell missed around and got a double double. As Max Acemiss, he led all shooters with 21 points as Texas would go on to win it 77 to 66, getting the ups upset over the 25th ranked Horn Frogs. Well, moving on to high school basketball as we continue to introduce the high school seniors who made the rosters for the first ever San Antonio sports all star basketball game. Last weekend, all of the 120 Hoopers gathered at the Alamo Dome to meet their all star teammates and head coaches. And we got to chat with Uvalde's Kendra Garcia, who's excited to impact the young basketball players in the Uvalde community. Then there's McCollum's Gabriela Gamboa, whose dad is a sergeant in the Bayard County Police Department. She wants to follow in his footsteps. Then there's YMLA's Jeremiah Conway, who played in the all star game for the football game 
game as well, and he wants to be a clinical psychologist. I definitely say what excites me is uh, the change that it can have on somebody's community. Um, just being able to go in and learn why the brain does certain things that it does, understand the behaviors of how people go about certain things and to be able to help them when it's something that they might not necessarily um, know that they're doing or might not necessarily remember. I think it'll mean a lot because I mean I have younger sisters um, like looking up to me and I have a lot of younger kids that I help at the Uvalde and just trying to get better. So I think I would like benefit a lot. Seeing like all the people that he has helped and all of the things that he's done with the job, I mean it just inspired me to like see what I could do for my, my community and just help people around. Uh, here are the details that you might want to write down on March 24th at Northside ISD Gym. We have the first ever All-Star Game plus a skills challenge and a three-point contest as well. 120 of the top local high school senior ballers will be split into eight teams in two different divisions, 5A and 6A, and then 1A through 4A plus the private school teams, where four games are going to be played in those respective divisions. For more information, just go to our sports section on our website ksat.com and coming up in just a few minutes we're going to hear from san antonio fc head coach alan marcina on how music is helping him connect with his new players Ooh, intriguing <laughs> that's a good tease it's all good. right well we'll stick around not just because i have to be here it's interesting they pay us <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thanks nick and we'll see you guys after this break Well, February is Black History Month, and a new exhibit that honors enslaved people opened today in Sutherland Springs. The exhibit, the exhibit is a display of quilt squares that represent the lives of the men and women who were enslaved at the Polly Plantation, known as Whitehall, in Wilson County. The quilt squares are used because there are no photos of those people. PhD scholar Melinda Creech is behind the exhibit. In all, there are 29 quilt squares with a description of each enslaved person's life. The display is a permanent exhibit in the Poly Room at the Sutherland Springs Historical Museum. And you may remember our Jesse DeGriotto told us about the Poly Plantation during a History Untold episode last summer. When a couple bought a new home in Wilson County, they did not realize they had purchased an ex-slave plantation. So the pair decided to learn more about the history of the home and renovate it. Jesse DeGriotto explains why the owners are being upfront about the history of the Whitehall Poly Mansion. Drivers speeding by may not even notice the two-story house, yet its wide porches seem to beckon visitors. Sit a while and enjoy the breeze at historic Whitehall Poly Mansion. A retired military couple, Keith and Robin Michalik, had already bought a home nearby when they saw this in 2014. We did not know what this building was. We thought it was a dance hall. Everything was in a state of dilapidation. And I said, I'll come back to Texas if we, this could be our retirement project. Old house, like it, let's fix it up. That again. We had a lot of energy like six <laughs> years ago. Robin Mushalik says it made perfect sense. We've always loved old houses. We love history. We love community. We love antiques. It certainly took plenty of both love and energy to take on decades of neglect. It took a year and a half just to pick up trash, trash, trash. There were six abandoned cars. Luckily, the previous owner took most of them with him. But by then, they'd begun to uncover what time had seemingly forgot. Oh my goodness, this is a historic gem. Says so on the historic marker. The house was built in the late 1840s by Joseph Pauley, one of the original settlers brought to Texas by Stephen F. Austin. Yet what it doesn't say. If you read that marker, you would have no clue that this was a slave plantation. Yet it should, says Moshalik, to reflect the reality of the Cibolo Valley in what was then a part of Bear County. Plantations were drawn to Cibolo Creek as a source of water for their cotton or other crops, even cattle. Joseph Polly's would be among the first of many to come. Cotton planters came from Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and the Carolinas, intending to establish plantations in the image of the South. Nearly 40 parcels along Cibolo Creek identified by LostTexasRoads.com show where the plantations were, who owned them, and how many were enslaved. And Polly's just one, he's a medium-sized plantation of 20 or so slaves. About a third were like the Polly's plantation, says the website's creator, historian Alan Cosson. 
He says the Cibolo Valley was as far as the plantations made it into the U.S. and one of the last places in the country where slavery existed. So the significance of the poly plantation and the other plantations along the Cibolo is significant. And we want to make sure that's part of the history we tell of the house. A part worth telling is about one of the rooms off of the breezeways that go down the middle of the house. It's the bedroom where it said Robert E. Lee slept when he was a U.S. Army colonel before the Civil War. If that's true, that's incredible. The cookhouse is right there, so the enslaved people would bring the food from there to here. Along with artifacts and antiques, the Moshaliks acquired for what's become a museum, they also found Joseph Polly's will. Having each one Negro girl slave in their profession, giving a, an enslaved person to one of his daughters, you know, each of his daughters, they get to choose. Joseph Polly is buried in the small family cemetery across the road from the mansion, leaving the Moshaliks to wonder. Where are the graves of the enslaved that die? African slaves were no longer property to be considered as wealth. And what about after emancipation? Where did they go? And we're finding all these freedmen colonies, dozens of them are around us. We just want to know more about the enslaved people. And this was this house. Wow. Visiting the Polly Mansion for the first time, Pastor Ray Warren was surprised to see. Among the enslaved identified so far, there they were his wife's ancestors. And their last name is right here, the Nyasis. Hers is right here. <laughs> right here. So yeah, I got some news for her. <laughs> a revelation that began with a couple's curiosity. People don't meet us without hearing about this house. <laughs> and all the work they put into it for visitors to tour and learn. We believe it's the first Thanksgiving in this room in 1854. A lot of this history would have been lost had we not preserved the house. This house will stand here easily for another hundred years. That's our contribution to the history of the great state of Texas. In Wilson County, Jesse DeGoyado, KSAT 12 News. If you want to learn more about the history of the Whitehall Pauley Mansion, just find it under our History Untold section on our website, ksat.com. We'll be right back. Families waiting on college financial aid packages will now have to wait a little bit longer. Colleges were supposed to start receiving student data from the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA today, earlier this week. That's now delayed until mid-March. The night team's Avery Everett spoke to local schools about how that will affect students waiting for financial aid. This shortened the timeline and can make it a bit more tight for students and families to make a decision on where to go to college in the fall. A new version of the financial aid application that's used by college students nationwide is now facing delays. We're going to be in a bit of a holding pattern. Just this week, the Department of Education announced that U.S. colleges and universities would not be given any data from the Free Applications for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, until mid-March. They didn't give an exact date. Schools across San Antonio tell us they were supposed to start receiving that data today. A lot of students are going to get aid packages later than they're typically used to. But delays have become a norm for the new FAFSA launch. It's not simply changing a table. You know, it's a complete rewrite and a complete redesign of the system. In 2020, Congress mandated a new simplified FAFSA form. There's always been a complaint that it was too difficult. Typically, students can start filling out that FAFSA in the fall, but the new streamlined application only soft launched a month ago. There's a whole list of glitches that have happened. And advisors tell us the rollout was rocky. That includes reports of identification problems and long waiting rooms. Now that the application is available 24-7, advisors say it's becoming more accessible. More students are going to be qualifying for free aid to then help them pay to go to school. Schools across San Antonio agree. They just say it's being bogged down by a new system. And there's still the question of when families will receive financial aid packages so they can start to plan for the new school year. I'm hopeful for, for April um, for students and families, um, but a lot of that is going to be dependent on what does mid-March mean. And that was Avery Everett reporting. FAFSA's priority deadline for fall students in Texas is March 15th. If financial aid is necessary to making your college decision, advisors say there is an online estimator. We have a link for that on KSAT.com.
All right, let's go back outside with live cam temperatures in the low 50s here in San Antonio this hour. So it already is a bit cool out there and it's going to be chilly by the time we're stepping out for any early Sunday morning activities. Now today it was actually a slightly warmer than average day. We had a low of 52, which is pretty close to where we are right now. That is well above the average of 43 and a high temperature of 71, six degrees above the average high for this time of year. Thanks to that sunshine that returned. It was 74 in New Braunfels, 77 in Catula, 66 over in Rock Springs. Now looking ahead near to slightly above average in terms of those afternoon highs into the upcoming week. We'll talk about that. Get you another look at the forecast and also those winds that are expected to pick up overnight. All right, so today was the day to get out and get things ready before the wind comes through. But first of all, let's talk about the rain. Let's talk about the because rain. that was loud and incredible. It was here in San Antonio. It was the perfect combination yeah. because yes, they were noisy, but we didn't have severe weather for the most part right, here in San Antonio. Right. So it was just drought denting rain. We did have a little bit of hail, especially out west near Brackettville. A few reports of that overnight too, and really strong winds as well north of Bear County. But the rain just so great to see. So here's a couple mm -hmm. of KSAT Connect photos that we had that were submitted from the rain. Those backyard area rain gauges almost eight tenths overnight. That's West nice. New Braunfels, almost two inches Whoa. in South Bear County. Love to see it. Uh, this is near Wiseman, about an inch and a quarter there. And I've got one more to show you, almost an inch and a half wow. in Alamo Ranch out on the west side. So thank you to everybody who sent in those KSAT Connect photos. It is so helpful for us to really look at the ground truth, exactly how much rain fell in those backyard rain gauges. So 0.84, that's how much we've seen so far this month. It's only the third day of February. We're doing pretty good in the rainfall department. And really, because of even the rain that we had to wrap up the month of January early last week, we've seen over seven and a half inches of rain so far this year. So a great start to the year in the rainfall department. By the way, all of the rain that we saw last night, not included in the latest drought monitor update because that came out on Thursday, but we did see some improvements from that late January rain. Still do have some extreme drought up into the hill country near Kerrville, Bernie and Bandera, and we do still have some moderate to severe drought in place in San Antonio. So we have a ways to go, but definitely chipping away at that drought, and that is exactly what we like to see. All right, looking ahead, though, rain chances unfortunately do come down. We are drying things out in the days ahead, but it will at least feel pretty nice out there. Chilly mornings followed by nice afternoons here in San Antonio, but it will be windy with those winds picking up overnight and especially into our Sunday morning. As of right now, pretty calm out there in and around the San Antonio area, but we do expect that to change here over the next several hours, especially tomorrow morning throughout the first half of the day. By the time you're stepping out for any early Sunday morning activities, plan for it to be pretty gusty. I think peak wind gusts could range in the 40 to 50 mile per hour range. By the time all is said and done, it still will be a bit breezy into your Sunday afternoon, but we will start to see those winds subside just a little bit more. But again, make sure all those loose lawn items are secured and tied down just to be on the safe side. Temperature wise, already mid 40s up in Kerrville, 52 degrees here in San Antonio. It's 54 off to our southeast in Kennedy, 55 in Gonzales, 55 as well down Highway 90 in Uvalde. A chilly start, mid 40s, right around 46 degrees in the Alamo City at 7 a.m. Plenty of sunshine is expected throughout the day, 61 at 11, 68 at 3 p.m. That is our forecast high temperature here in San Antonio. Looking ahead to the upcoming work week, Still chilly mornings expected, but comfortable afternoons in the mid to upper 60s. That area of low pressure that bought us some rain last night is going to continue to work eastward. A high pressure system moves in by the middle of the week, which is why things are pretty quiet. But then we'll see a second area of low pressure move into the central plains by Thursday. When we combine that with some additional moisture moving back in, sure, a stray shower can't completely be ruled out Thursday and into Friday. More notable, but I Isolated rain chances look to return as we head into next weekend. All right. Thank you so much, Mia. Mm -hmm.
All right, Nick, after such a close game yesterday, we yeah. were all excited for this Spurs game, but not so much. Yeah, it wasn't a fun night for Spurs fans. The Spurs were losing their third straight game tonight. This time, it's against the Cleveland Cavaliers. We're going to hear from Coach Pop on this loss. Plus, we're going to hear from SAFC head coach Alan Marcina on how he's used music to help connect with his new players. So stay with us. The San Antonio Spurs seven game homestand came to an end tonight. The Spurs looking to bounce back after a heart wrenching one point loss to the New Orleans Pelicans. Victor Wembanyama came out firing, knocking down the corner three. He finished with another double double, 19 points and 10 rebounds. Uh, give you a little bit of a give and go as Wemby takes flight, slamming home the dunk. Nobody's jumping with him. That gave the Frost Bank Center a little bit of excitement in life, but it was star guard for the Cavs, Donovan Mitchell, who went off for 31 points and even got ejected after a fight with Zach Collins at the end of the game. As the Cavs would go on to win it 117 to 101, Coach Pop shared his thoughts on the team just not having it tonight. Their length and physicality poses a big problem, and so does their talent. Uh, you know, this is. You know, we didn't have as much juice as last night, obviously. It's three and four nights, three weekends in a row, and, you know, it started to show. So I think they've, you know, they're trying hard, but couldn't make a shot in the first half. Uh, came back, played better in the second half, uh, get a little rest, and then move on. The Spurs will start their nine game rodeo road trip on Wednesday when they take on the Miami Heat. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. If you haven't heard by now, former Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator Dan Quinn is going to be the new head coach of the Washington Commanders. And the Commanders wanted to make a couple of Cowboys fans mad this afternoon. Take a look at this. The mascot for the Commanders, Major Tutty, tweeting out, sorry for taking your guy, and then at Rowdy Cowboys, the mascot for the Dallas Cowboys, laughing at the Cowboys, who outscored the Commanders 83-20 to in the two games that they played in the regular season this past year. Just saying. But according to Adam Schefter, the Cowboys may have found their new guy. Former Minnesota Vikings head coach Mike Zimmer is reportedly meeting with the Cowboys for the open defensive coordinator position. Now, Zimmer was an assistant coach for the Cowboys back from 94 to 2006. He won a Super Bowl in 1995 as a defensive backs coach. After being promoted to the defensive coordinator position in Dallas, the Cowboys defense gave up the fewest yards in the NFL back in 2003. We, of course, will keep you updated if Zimmer becomes the next defensive coordinator for the Dallas Cowboys coming back to Texas one more time. San Antonio FC began its training camp this week. It's a roster full of new players, so they're getting to know each other. Head coach Alan Marcina used the music in the locker room to connect with some new players, asking them questions about their childhood memories and obstacles each player has had to overcome and how they connect with these songs that they've chosen. So coach, you want to share your songs? I can share it. Uh, one of them was Run DMC, Down with the Kings, and uh, I won't bore you for the, with the details behind it. And, and then the other one was, uh, was from uh, Gladiator, and it was the theme song of Gladiator, and, and again, the story behind that I, I shared with the group. First week, week one objectives is relationship building. Mm -hmm. We want to get to know uh, each and every one is people first, players second. Um, and that's why we do these acti activities to, to open up and be vulnerable and get to know and understand everyone's motivations. To us, that's important. And then starting a week two, it's about game model principles and on-field mentality. We'll be right back with a final look at your forecast, so stay with us.